It's truly an honor to be here. I know this is a very important lecture series, and uh, I'm, uh, I see the company that I'm in, and I'm, I'm humbled by it. Um, even John Jost, who's a good friend of mine, so I can make fun of him. Um, and I'm sure he gave a wonderful talk. So um, before, before I launch into my, you, you know, obligatory PowerPoint slides, uh, I want to give a couple of caveats. Uh, one is I am going to be talking about implicit bias, uh, but I want to be clear from the start that um, implicit bias, as important as I think it is and many people think it is, is not the be all, end all of the world's problems right now, despite what you may be hearing from some sources. Uh, it, I will talk about what it means, how we measure it, and the relationship between implicit biases and policing and problems in policing. But it's not the root problem that we have in policing today. Um, and it is not the root problem that we have in society today. It is really um, an emergent property of larger structural inequalities that we have that get transmitted through human cognition and human relations. So I just want to be clear that I'm not trying to argue that implicit bias um, is, is all is the entirety of the problem. The second caveat is that uh, while I will be discussing policing in America, uh, and I will be saying some things about policing in America that police find very hard to hear and, uh, and prosecutors find very hard to hear, uh, I don't want to give the impression that I am a critic of police uh, or that I'm in any way hostile um, or adversarial toward police. I actually um, count uh, this is an, an old lame excuse. Some of my best friends are police, I should say. Um, but I do count police officers among some of my, my dear friends and people that I admire. And I think it's a noble profession, uh, a noble profession that nevertheless has some cultures within it that are toxic and, uh, and that involves people exercising extraordinary power uh, that when those, the decisions that they make and the actions that they take are influenced by the biases, implicit or explicit, that all of us have, those, the effects are more dire than in other circumstances. But I'll be talking about bias in policing. I could be talking about bias in university admissions. I could be talking about bias in healthcare. Uh, I'm not trying to make a special case that police are especially uh, biased or that they have a speci an espe especially great problem with implicit bias. They're, the reason why I study policing is one, that as I mentioned before, their behaviors, their actions have particularly profound effects on other people's lives. And frankly, from a scientific perspective, their actions have relatively palpable, quantifiable effects. And so from a scientific perspective, we can learn a lot from policing, uh, but we can also contribute a lot to policing to help them understand how psychological processes like implicit bias, like stereotype threat and others, influence how they behave and undermine their ability to perform their duties in a manner that most of them would want to, which is in a, f a fair and, and constitutional manner. Okay, so that's it for caveats. Um, let's, let's go to the slides. Just to provide a, a little backdrop, uh, many of you I'm sure are aware that in the period since what is often called the war on drugs, uh, which started in the 1970s, the rate of incarceration of Americans has gone up dramatically, but that's been borne overwhelmingly by African Americans. And so not only is there a continuing discrepancy over this period, but the discrepancy between incarceration rates for blacks and whites has grown. The slopes of those rates are different, and they've maintained over this period. Although I will say this ends at 2010, and the numbers are starting to look a little better post-2010, as the country starts to grapple with the notion of mass incarceration and states like my own California start to try to realign the populations uh, who are going through the criminal justice system. I think more striking is a projection that the Bureau of Justice Statistics carried out in 2003 where they looked at the prevailing trends in incarceration at that time and they estimated that for children born, for males born in 2003, their likelihood of being incarcerated at some point in their lives was about 6% uh, for whites, or I should say that they estimated 6% of white males would be incarcerated at some point in their lives. But for Latinos and blacks, the numbers are considerably higher. And this is one of those graphs, I mean, I teach statistics and we use bar graphs so that we can compare central tendencies across groups. Um, but this is one of those graphs where I could cover 
uh, one or two of the other bars, and we could just look at that bar for African Americans, and we could say, without having to do much calculation, that a 32% incarceration rate for black males is an unsustainable, untenable trend and a devastating uh, feature of our society. So this is a, these are numbers that I find staggering and that motivate, in part, um, my interest in finding out why we have such dramatic discrepancies and potentially, and I'm not going to promise the world, but potentially what can be done to, to mitigate those, those disparities and those, those large numbers. Uh, this is a new way of thinking about this for me, even though it's going to come across, I think, as pretty straightforward and simple. Um, but what the, the general thesis of what I'm going to argue here is that police officers are normal human beings with normal cognition. And as I mentioned before, they have abnormally great power and discretion. And they have extraordinary influence over other people's lives. But in terms of their judgment and cognitive processes, they're pretty normal. And in fact, the only time I ever get pushed back on that is when I'm talking to an audience of police officers and they, they like to think that they're not normal in some way. Um, but we have human judgment. And human judgment is, and I apologize to the social and cognitive psychologists in the room for this oversimplification, but human ju judgment is influenced by such things as biases, stereotypes, and prejudices, uh, and also misperceptions of things. We, we cannot always accurately perceive what's in front of us. Um, and then the fact that when we're making a judgment or decision about something or someone, we inevitably have incomplete information. We cannot have all the information we need to make an assessment about what somebody's thinking, what they're feeling, what they're going to do, what they just did even. Uh, we're operating in a, a, with a degree of uncertainty and in, a, in an environment of ambiguity when making these judgments, and that's true for police officers too. Now, because of all of these forces and others, human judgment can lead to disparate treatment when we are, or discrimination, when we are making decisions about other people. And what I want to argue for the most part, the punchline I'm going to give away now, is that particularly for policing, what is one of the most important moderating and mediating factors in between the human judgment and the disparate outcomes uh, is discretion. And I, I will argue that police officers have extraordinary discretion in their, uh, in their daily activities and that it's probably too much discretion and in places where it's been reined in, we've seen better outcomes. The word discretion is problematic because it has multiple meanings, but here I just mean, by discretion, I mean latitude, their ability uh, to make choices. I'm not saying, when I say discretion, I'm not saying they're being discreet. I'm saying that they are exercising discretion. Okay, so in policing in particular, discretion is very high. Uh, and that's in part because law enforcement in America is highly decentralized. In the UK, there's a college of policing, there's a centralized authority over policing and in other places too, but in the United States, there's no centralized authority. The Department of Justice is not at the top of a pyramid of the 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the United States giving directives down. They're giving out little grants at best and they're threatening to investigate and sue and sometimes carrying that out when possible with in the previous administration, all 12 litigators they had in the Civil Rights Division. But not, that was sarcastic. That's not a lot, given that there are 18,000 police departments. And so, um, so th there's this decentralized environment uh, where departments and officers have discretion. Departments, chiefs, command staff have discretion to determine what kind of training they're going to give, what kind of guidance is there, they're going to give. My team at Berkeley right now is going, is pouring over dozens of police department policy documents and finding dramatic variation across departments, even though there are established best practices which are not always adopted. In addition to that, the central construct that police officers use in making decisions about whether they can interfere with the life of another person is reasonable suspicion. This is what determines whether they can stop somebody and whether they can search somebody. And reasonable this or that determines a lot of other things that they can do, like use of force. Or reason, the, if you had good reason to believe that somebody posed a threat of bodily harm to you, you can use force. And so this is a construct that's inherently vague. We don't even really, as psychologists, know very much about suspicion. We just have our intuitive sense of what it is. 
And then the courts apply this mod modifier to that, reasonable, which the courts are very open about saying, we don't really know what reasonable is, but it's something above a hunch and below probable cause. And so officers are out there using their discretion, making judgments based on reasonable suspicion, and stopping hundreds of thousands of, in of individuals, most of whom are not involved in any kind of foul play on, a, on an annual basis. Uh, and the courts defer to this standard. They, they articulate the reasonable suspicion standard and then they defer to the officers to be the ones to articulate whether what they thought was reasonable. You can see this in this very influential ruling from the Supreme Court, the Wren case, uh, where the court said, we think these, in reference to past Supreme Court rulings they've made, foreclose any argument that the constitutional reasonableness of traffic stops depends on the actual motivations of the individual officers involved. And so what the court has essentially said in this and other similar rulings is that even if the actual motivations for a stop were racial or in some other form biased and, and irrelevant to the policing objective, that's not what's important. Uh, what's important essentially is what the officer articulates. So in the absence of concrete smoking gun evidence that an officer was racially motivated in deciding to make a stop or a search, in the absence of that kind of evidence, the court is going to defer to the officer's description and discretion. And we can talk later about you know, why that came to pass and what alternatives to that could be, but that's a, that's a fairly long conversation. Uh, the New York Police Department is a, an excellent source of data on this, in part because they're the biggest law enforcement agency in the country with roughly 35,000 sworn officers, uh, and because it's the biggest city in the country, and because they're an industry leader, but also because be, due to their uh, implementation of the Project Impact or Stop, Question, and Frisk program, they've been under scrutiny by a number of actors, including the state of New York, but also the federal government, and then a private class of citizens that sued and, and won against the city over the Stop and Frisk program. So for over 20 years, there has been reasonably good data coming out of New York on who they're stopping. Police officers are required to provide a written report for every stop that they make of a pedestrian or, or a vehicle stop. Stop and frisk is primarily targeted at pedestrian stops. And there were really two periods of extreme stop and frisk, and in this series, I'm gonna start with the second one. But it was happening in the 1990s as well. Uh, and there was political and public pressure to reduce it, and it came down, and then it came roaring back in the, two, the early 2000s under, uh, under uh, not actually under Giuliani, that was the previous administration, but under Mayor Bloomberg and Commissioner Kelly. Remember that name, Raymond Kelly, we're gonna come back to him. So this is the rate of stop and frisk in New York over this time period. You can see there's dramatic variation over that period. Uh, and what we essentially see is from 2000 to 2011, a dramatic increase in the rate of stop and frisk. So these are stops per year. So in 2011, NYPD made 685,000 discretionary stops of pedestrians in New York City. And then they came under pressure and they brought that rate down uh, and there was multiple sources of pressure. Some was political, but, but a major one was this lawsuit, uh, the, Floyd, the Floyd et al. case. Uh, and by 2015, they're down to 22,000 stops. So there are a couple of messages from this. One, uh, there was a period where there were a lot of stops, discretionary stops happening in New York City. But another message from these data is that there is clearly the opportunity to vary that rate of stopping without catastrophic effects. And one of, the, one of the big questions out there about New York is, well, what's gonna happen to the crime rate? And, and the proponents of stop and frisk were saying, you're gonna, get a, you're gonna get a crime wave if you reduce stop and frisk. In fact, over the period of decline, the crime rate has remained stable over this period. And, and that's true for, appears to be true for 2016 as well. And by the way, in 2016, we have even fewer rates, uh, an even lower rate of stops. These stops are borne disproportionately by people of color in New York, and especially young African-American men. And so if you break this out, as, the, as the, this research group from John Jay uh, University did, uh, you see that African-Americans are bearing the brunt of this. And in 2011, you see, in fact, that uh, the rate of stops per 100,000 is over 100,000 for African-American men, uh, actually from the years 20, 
2005 to uh, 2013, I believe. So the average African American man, and this applies to the under 18 and from about age 21 to 24 as well, the average young black man in America is gonna get stopped uh, at least once a year in New York City over that period. And now we see an improvement. I'm gonna come back to this graph later because it's, I'm going to illustrate how reducing that officer discretion, reducing the rate at which they're making stops, has a positive effect for all civilians in terms of reducing their likelihood of being stopped and or searched. Um, but it does seem to also compress the disparities. And, and this is more than just, uh, just an illusion here. There is a ratio compression going on here that I'll, I'll show better later. Uh, among those stops, uh, uh, this, this is for all stops in that peak year of 2011. Among those stops, about half of them end up getting frisked. Now, the standard for a frisk is reasonable suspicion that the person is possess in possession of a, of a, well, it used to be that they were in possession of a weapon that could do grave bodily harm to you. It's been expanded through court rulings to be really more reasonable suspicion that that person was, is, or will be in, uh, in the process of a crime. So it's very broad discretion at this point. Uh, so you see that among those stops, about half of them end up getting frisked based on some, the officer's perception that that person is suspicious of something. Um, and then what you see is that uh, the rate of physical force is roughly proportional across the groups among those frisked. But because African Americans are subjected to so many stops and frisked, so many more stops and frisked, they are subjected to many more uh, incidents of use of force. With regard to the actual outcomes of these stops and frisks, what we see is, that, and I'm using these data at this point to illustrate the high degree of discretion officers have because among all of those stops, the arrests only uh, happen in about 6%. So the overwhelming majority of these stops are fruitless. Uh, now, we can talk later about whether there's a deterrent effect that's worthwhile or not, but in terms of incapacitation uh, of criminals, uh, findings of contraband or weapons, or even outstanding warrants, which is actually what most of these arrests are for, uh, are, are at a fairly low rate. And interestingly, and these, these are the percent arrested among those stopped. Uh, and what we see, uh, yes, and what we see is that interestingly, the arrest rate is actually higher for whites than it is for blacks and Hispanics. This is a finding that we see across a lot of jurisdictions, which is that the what we call the hit rate or the outcome rate tends to be higher, not always, but tends to be higher for whites who are stopped or searched uh, than for blacks and Latinos. And my inference from that and others as well is that whites who are stopped are needing to meet a higher threshold of suspiciousness in order to get stopped uh, and therefore actually are more likely to be engaged in some kind of criminal activity and to be found in possession of something illicit. More evidence of the high degree of discretion that officers have when making these kinds of decisions are the reasons that they give on their forms when they report why they made a stop. And what you can see is that for all groups, overwhelmingly the most common reason uh, is what's called furtive movements, which is a, 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 an objectively subjective criterion. Um, and, and interestingly, you'll see actually that the rate of use of furtive movements is lower for whites, which may start to give us a signal about why their hit rates are higher for whites because they're using, a less, they're using some less subjective standards, but also casing a victim. That really basically means loitering or standing around or looking at somebody. Um, acting as a lookout could also be loitering. But these are things that, that officers are not particularly held to any accountability or standard for being able to justify that this is actually what they observed. Uh, they're allowed to provide these and they provide this information after the conclusion of the stop. And so we don't know whether this is the actual basis for the stop or it's the, it's the post hoc rationale that they're offering for the stop. So I should say um, these data are very useful, they're very powerful, but we do have to take them all with a grain of salt because they're only as good as the reporting that, it, that drives these data. So to the extent that officers are perceiving things accurately and then, and then sincerely reporting what happened, these data are useful. We have lots of reason to believe that these are that this is underreporting, and that officer that many more uh, discretionary stops are happening than these. There's also some reason to believe that there are stops that ha that uh, don't happen that are reported because officers there are incentives for officers to make lots of stops. So 
take the data with a grain of salt, but I think the interesting variation over time and how, it's, how stable it is over time in terms of the disproportions across racial and ethnic groups, but also how much it varies as a function of policy changes, suggests that there are, there's a meaningful signal in, the, in, this, in these data. Coming back to the idea of dif differential hit rates, uh, if we look at the outcomes of frisks in particular, uh, which is where the officer has a better reason to believe that the individual is involved in crime, uh, we see again that across all uh, domains, possession of contraband drugs, uh, a non-gun weapon, uh, or, and whether the person is arrested, that whites are more likely to yield outcomes than blacks and Latinos across all these. In the area of guns, it's a pretty flat line, but you might take note at how low those bars are for gun yields in New York, even though one of the largest, one of the biggest rationales for stop and frisk was taking guns off the street. But typically, uh, they would take six to 800 guns off the street annually, uh, so the very, very low hit rate. Now again, somebody might argue, well, that's, that means stop and frisk is working. They're deterring guns. That's why nobody's carrying guns, and when they get stopped, they don't have guns on them. That's an argument. We can have that discussion later on. Um, I don't buy it, but you're free to consider it. Um, a lot of the discussion lately around racial disparities in, in policing has been around use of force, and particularly around lethal use of force, and that's obviously important. Um, the outcomes, the numbers are much smaller than the stops. We see in New York alone, there are many more uh, discretionary stops than there are incidents of use of force nationally uh, in a given year. So, uh, so the, the use of force is an, another topic of concern. It's related. The racial disparities that we see in use of force, I think, are driven by some of the same biases and some of the structural inequities. Uh, but it's, I've, I've found it interesting and compelling and also a little bit concerning that attention has finally been paid to racial disparities in policing only in response to, uh, to these use of force incidents and only after they've been starting to get captured on video with some regularity. Now, it's important to address that problem, but it's only the tip of the iceberg in terms of the impact that officers, that police officers are having on the lives of community members, particularly people of color, uh, in their more run-of-the-mill interactions with people that don't involve force. And I'll talk later about the collateral effects that are involved in contact with the police, whether it ends up without a citation or with a citation or with an arrest or with use of force. But contact with the police is not a benign event for most people. And the rates at which it's happening in a lot of places cause disruption in people's lives, whether or not force is used. Nevertheless, we can look to the lethal force data to find further evidence of some very compelling disparities that are hard to explain um, without considering the influence of bias on the part of the police. And then I will talk about the psychological research, the science that connects those dots and explains why we have good reason to believe that the disparities I'm gonna describe are caused at least in part by cognitive biases. So this has to do with um, lethal force used against police officers. Uh, mm -hmm. In the late 1990s, uh, no, I guess it was about 2008, uh, there were a couple of high profile cases where off-duty police officers out of uniform were fatally shot by on-duty police officers. Both of these cases occurred in the state of New York, and so the governor commissioned a task force to investigate uh, fatal shootings of off-duty police officers by on-duty police officers. This task force took its mandate fairly broadly and looked across the nation, and over the 30-year period that they looked at, 28-year period that they looked at, they identified 10 such cases of fatal officer-involved shootings of off-duty off police officers that happened nationally. And while over that period it's a conservative estimate to say that about 75% of police officers in America were white, um, only one of those 10 cases was the victim white. Eight were African American and one was Latino. Now, th these are small numbers. I acknowledge that. I teach statistics. But these are also population level data. That we're not trying to make an inference about a population from a sample here. This is what happened. And of course, there might be many explanations for this. But this disproportion is pretty dramatic. And my students and I have 
done some simple calculations to figure out the likelihood that this would happen by chance, other than there being some other systemic cause of this. Uh, and it's, you know, it's less than, it's over one in a million uh, ch uh, that this would happen by chance. Uh, so, or, sorry, it's less than one over one, one million. We can also look to the more recent data that's been uncovered in the, on this topic um, as a result of the more recent movement and the more recent revelations about racial disparities in, in police use of force. Uh, the, the Washington Post and The Guardian in the UK started collecting uh, in media reports and police reports and other sort of crowdsourced information about uh, lethal shootings. Actually, The Guardian one, I think, is just all lethal force, and The Washington Post is lethal shootings by police. Now, prior to them collecting these data, based on the police reports alone, it was typical that in a, in a given year, there would be roughly 500 reported cases of lethal shootings by police in the United States. What they found was that it's closer to 1,000. When you look at coroner's reports and, uh, and media reports, and you know, there's an old saw that says you can't hide a body, so homicide data is really perfect, but in fact, it turns out even homicide data, and these are homicides, uh, even homicide data are imperfect, and there are ways that, that deaths become recategorized as accidental and the like that, uh, that can mask some of this. So the Washington Post first discovered that there were dramatic, that the actual number was dramatically higher, and, and, and they were using, I think, very rigorous criteria for identifying these cases. Um, they also found that among the victims who were armed with a deadly weapon at the time that they were shot, uh, they were typically white, although they were not disproportionately white, they were disproportionately black, but at least the columns line up in the, in the right order uh, with regard to who's more likely to get shot uh, by the police. Unfortunately, for those who are unarmed, the pattern flips and we see that even actually numerically, there were more African Americans than whites who were fatally shot by police while unarmed. Another way to look at the same data would be to say among those who are fatally shot by the police within each group, what percent were unarmed? And you see that whites are much less likely to be unarmed among those who are fatally shot by the police. It sort of mirrors the outcome data that says that whites, in order to be the object of police action, have to reach a higher threshold of suspiciousness in order to be the subject of that action. Awkward segue here, sorry. But um, uh, this, these findings really shouldn't and haven't come as a big surprise to social psychologists who have been studying the effect of biases, implicit or explicit, on behavior for a number of decades now. The reason I put this up here is just as a, my shortcut illustration of how human beings process information schematically. That we, we don't take every object on there and, and uh, encode in our memory the individual shapes. We see triangles. You may see one or two triangles. If you're a member of the tribe like me, you might see a Star of David, uh, thinking about Passover. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, and, and it's, you might, even, you might even think that that interior triangle is a little bit wider than the, you might even see a line there that looks like shading, but it's not there. It's an illusion because our brains are quickly trying to figure out what's in front of us. And that's how we process information. As I mentioned earlier, we never have all the information we need to make a perfectly 100% certain uh, inference about something or, or determination about something. We have incomplete information and we fill in the blanks based on what we know already, and we know about triangles already, and we see this information. You can imagine how highly adaptive this is uh, to, to be able to infer that there's a triangle even though you can't see every, every component part of it. So our, our cognition is schematic. We, we have prior conceptions of how things are. We encode things in our memory in categories. Um, this is actually some, interestingly, some of this research was done in the 1960s and 70s at UC Berkeley by cognitive psychologists. Go, go Bears. Um, and so, sorry, is that not okay? Uh, just don't say anything about Stanford. Then we, then we start getting into trouble. So, um, so we perceive and encode and retrieve things from memory using these prior schemas that we have, and we build these schemas very facilely. 
Um, and this is true for how we perceive and encode information about social objects like other people and groups as well. And in fact, really, you could think of stereotypes. We all have our own <clears throat> personal definition of what a stereotype is. But in modern social cognitive psychology, <clears throat> stereotypes are thought of as schema-driven perceptions of others. Now, <clears throat> social psychologists have been studying stereotyping and prejudice for about a century now. And we know from that science a fair amount about how interpersonal and intergroup perception occurs. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this. What I want to emphasize <clears throat> is one area in particular, which is what social psychology has discovered about <clears throat> the process uh, by which stereotypes influence our judgments. And this gets into the reference I made earlier to how we're often making judgments about others and other things under conditions of ambiguity. And so what stereotypes and other schemas that we have do is they help us to disambiguate ambiguous information. Again, we see an object, we can't see all of it, but we say that's probably a triangle because it's got all these features of a triangle, and if I went over and looked more closely, it would be. We see another person and we say that person looks like a man. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm gonna make an inference based on some physical features of that person. And, um, and we do that with people based on their categories, gender, but also race, age, size, and, um, and, and this is, I think, something that gets lost in a lot of the lay conceptions about how bias and discrimination works. There's an expectation that there's a degree of intentionality about it, that we are fully aware that we are applying our prior knowledge about a group to an individual, when in fact it's more likely that we are typically trying to understand uh, what is motivating somebody, what they're thinking about, and we don't have the information that we need for that, and so we're using whatever is already there for us to make that determination. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is normal cognition, and police officers are normal human beings with normal cognition, so they're subject to this too, but I'm gonna show you some direct evidence that it's true for police officers as well. Um, this for the cognitive psychologists in the room, this will be old hat. Um, but I want, I want to provide a very straightforward, rudimentary paradigm that has been used to study what we now call implicit cognition or unconscious cognition or automatic memory and cognition. Uh, and this is the um, word stem completion task. And the task is, uh, hopefully it'll become apparent why I'm focusing on this one obscure procedure. The task is, uh, is simply to ask people to fill in the, the word with the first letter that comes to mind when they see it. And you can see I've picked one here that has a lot of different correct responses. Uh, unbeknownst to subjects in the experiments that use this to test for unconscious um, perception and memory, uh, they were exposed to subliminal frames of uh, images that relate to one or another possible meaning of this word stem. So some people might see Actually, this work was done so long ago, they probably didn't have such elaborate images. <laughs> um, and they used to have to use a tachistoscope, which was just a really fast slide projector, but we can just do them on our laptops now. Um, but anyway, this, you know, this image would be presented for 15 milliseconds or something like that, and it might be masked before and after by some confusing stimuli. And, uh, and so the person doing the task has no conscious experience of having seen this image, and in fact, if they're tested afterward and they're shown this image and another one, they're, they're not going to do any better than chance in telling you which one they think they just saw. That's the, that's the criterion for whether this is truly subliminal. And what you find is what people are subliminally exposed to an image like this, they're more likely to fill that in with an O, or this they might put a U, or this they might put an A. I had a lot of fun doing Google images for this, this part of the talk, uh, so I better go through it faster because it's a waste of time. So, um, so what we know from this is that people process the meaning of information that they have no conscious awareness of having been exposed to, and they process it in a meaningful manner so that it can disambiguate an ambiguous stimulus and cause them to treat it as one thing as opposed to another. Now, Jennifer Eberhardt, uh, who is, uh, has been involved in this national justice database that I'm talking about, uh, and her colleagues, Phil Goff and Val Purdy and Paul Davies uh, carried out a set of studies that build on this general idea and I think most elegantly 
illustrate a lot of this in one microcosmic study in the sense that they provide people with an ambiguous stimulus that they need to disambiguate and they subliminally prime them uh, with race-related images and, and show how uh, subliminal exposure to race stimuli causes people to think differently with regard to crime. So in this case, they show people images like this of objects that are either crime-related like this one or not crime-related. And the task of the, and they, they see 41 frames over the course of it, but they're, what they're really seeing is one image in the middle that's becoming depixelated and becoming less ambiguous. And their task is to indicate as quickly as they can whether it's a crime-related object or not. But uh, again, unbeknownst to the subjects, they're either being subliminally primed with black, a black face prior to this decision or a white face or a neutral non-race stimulus. And what they find is that uh, people, when exposed to the black face, take fewer frames to identify crime-related crime related objects than when exposed to a white face or a neutral stimulus. And in fact, people exposed to white faces take longer than when exposed to the neutral stimulus to identify crime-related objects. So black primes thoughts of crimes, and white seems to actually suppress thinking about crime relative to the neutral condition here. Uh, they have another experiment where they prime people with crime-related objects, and then subliminally, and then they, they check to see where their eye gaze was on a computer screen, and, and every subsequent screen to the subliminal image, there's a black or a white, there's a black and a white face on the screen, and they counterbalance where they're presented, and there's a dot on one side of the screen to the other, and they ask them to identify as quickly as possible where the dot on the screen is, and they find that when people have been subliminally primed to think about crime, they're faster at identifying the dot being on the black face than being on the white face. So race makes people think about crime, and crime makes people think about race. There's a whole slew of implicit measures. I'm, I'm, not going to talk about the methodology behind measuring implicit stereotypes and implicit prejudice or implicit associations more generally. Um, but there are a number of studies now showing that these computerized reaction time methods that we use, and, and for those of you who have not ever done this, I recommend that you go to um, projectimplicit.org and, and try it out for yourself. Take it with a grain of salt. It's going to give you a score at the end. And take that with a big grain of salt because um, I think that people uh, and, and all the colleagues I know who do this kind of work on implicit bias, non-conscious bias, agree uh, that these measures are useful at the aggregate level, but should be used with great caution if trying to make an inference about an individual. Like other psychological measures, they're imperfect, and they have limited test-retest reliability. It's, 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 it's OK, but it's not the kind of thing you would want to hang a hiring decision on, for example, or a promotion decision on. So, um, or even a decision about who to be friends with, or a decision about whether you like yourself anymore or not, because sometimes people get feedback that they're implicitly biased, and they come away from it feeling pretty bad about it. So many grains of salt if you visit Project Implicit, or if you've done it before and you've been feeling bad about it. Um, but what, what we do know from these studies is in addition to these implicit measures, these index scores that we get from these computerized tasks, correlating with comparable measures of explicit or explicit measures of comparable constructs, um, they also correlate with uh, or have been shown in many studies to correlate with actual behaviors, uh, including employment discrimination. Uh, Chris Finn and I exploited the use of an implicit measure, not the implicit association test, um, in the uh, American National Election Studies, finding it to be predictive of voting for John McCain over Barack Obama in 2008. Um, actual cr crime. Uh, suicidality, um, the green study of medical decisions looks at actual medical residents and finds a relationship between implicit anti-black bias and the likelihood of prescribing a particular treatment for a black patient. And then Eric Knowles and I have looked at the relationship between an implicit association between blacks and weapons and racial bias in the use of force as measured by something called the shooter task, which I'm going to describe now. Now, the shooter task, I love talking about other people's work because it's generally better than mine. Um, but the shooter task was developed by Josh Carell uh, and his colleagues at the University of Colorado. And actually, simultaneously, um, Tony Greenwald and some of his colleagues were developing a very similar task. So there was sort of a zeitgeist around 2000 of social psychologists thinking about this issue of racial bias and shooting. And it was happening, and a lot of us were kind of thinking about it. Josh 
beat us all to the punch and did an a exemplary job of, of developing this procedure called the shooter task. And what he did was to uh, present people with images of uh, black and white men who were either holding guns or non-gun objects. And the task was to quote unquote shoot uh, the, the ones holding the guns as fast as you can. And the typical finding is that people are faster to shoot black men holding guns than white men holding guns. They're faster to do the not shoot response to whites who are unarmed than to blacks who are unarmed. And they're more likely to make the error of shooting unarmed blacks than shooting unarmed whites. Now this is a task, it's not particularly ecologically valid. They're actually not shooting anything. They're pressing buttons on a, on a response box. Um, and they're only seeing these frames fairly rapidly. Uh, but the pattern of results is pretty compelling and it comports pretty well with what we're seeing in the actual real world data like the Washington Post data and the, and the, unarmed, uh, the out, off duty police officer data. As I mentioned before, and here's my gratuitous slide of a correlation uh, that doesn't need a line graph, but there it is. And, uh, but there's about a 0.3 correlation in our study between this race weapons implicit measure, race weapons association implicit measure, and the shooter task. We did this study for a completely other reason, but this was one of the findings that we had along the way. Um, and it, in case you're wondering, uh, police officers, as I mentioned, are normal human beings with normal cognition. And so they do this as well, but it's been demonstrated directly, uh, Everhart and colleagues, did this same set of experiments with an actual police officer sample and found them to exhibit this same bias. Um, and uh, Corell and Ashby Plant and others have replicated shooter bias with police officer samples. In some of those samples, the officers have only exhibited the bias. And by the way, maybe it should go without saying, but just to be a good empiricist, let me remind us all that when I say people exhibit this, <laughs> I mean that the average subject exhibits this. And there's considerable variation. In fact, that was one of the things we were looking for in that study that I just described with the gratuitous correlation line, uh, is to look for actual variation. So there are some people who showed the other kind of shooter bias. They're more prone to shoot whites than blacks. And there are some people who associate whites with weapons more than blacks with weapons. So there's some meaningful variation on these tasks. But the average subject in these experiments, whether they be college undergrads, community sample members, or police officers, are faster, uh, the average person is faster to shoot armed blacks than armed whites. In the police officer samples, in some of those samples, the officers have only shown that bias on reaction time and not in the errors. They, they have not exhibited the bias in terms of being more likely to erroneously shoot unarmed blacks relative to unarmed whites. Uh, in some of the samples, they do. My view is that if you put enough time pressure on them and enough stress on them, that that bias in reaction time, that facility that you see in reaction time would translate into an error. And again, I think the real world data supports that idea. Um, but there's a glimmer of hope there that officers with their own training may be less vulnerable to this. And you might wonder um, whether you know, there, what would happen if we had a lot of armed civilians feeling empowered to use lethal force. <clears throat> and I won't mention any of the names. Okay. So police stereotype, and then of course there's this evidence from the field, these racial disparities in stop rates, uh, racial disparities in lethal force against police officers themselves, who you would expect to be less, least likely, they're not committing crimes, and they're least likely to be exhibiting threat. Um, and then uh, there is considerable evidence in complaints against police officers that, uh, the, that racial bias is a component there as well. I don't want to get bogged down in this because there's other stuff I want to get to, but I couldn't resist putting uh, the next couple of slides up uh, as a placeholder for me to say that I've done some work to try to investigate the effect that if police, and this is moving away from use of force now to the, to the general topic of stops and frisks and the like. Um, one argument holds, and this is not unpopular among in policing circles, holds that, well, if minority communities are responsible for more of the crime, doesn't it make sense for police officers to pay attention to those communities? That would be the efficient thing to do. And I have, have always had problems with that argument in part because the conclusion that minority communities are, are responsible for more crime is driven by the law enforcement, crimin, 
criminal justice data, which is potentially skewed by the decisions that the officers are making, and you could get this vicious feedback loop. Um, and we really don't have good data on offending for most kinds of crimes aside from the arrest data. And so we're not so sure about that. In any event, I, I thought that the stereotypes could be driving the enforcement outcomes, which could be driving the stereotypes. And I ran, uh, in the absence of the data for actually testing that directly, I ran a lot of simulations to see what would happen if police officers focused their energies on a minority group relative to a majority group. And this is just to say, I'm not gonna try to unpack all of this, but it's just to say that um, under this assumption, if you assume that the minority group, the uh, blue line, is offending at the same rate, if, if they're stopped by the police, they'll be, they'll be caught in possession of something illicit at the same rate as the majority group. If the police pay more attention to that group, they're gonna catch more people from that group, uh, even if their offending rates are the same. And so even though at the beginning of that process they may be incarcerated at the same rate, if police persist in, uh, in profiling the minority group, they're, they're gonna catch more of them and they're gonna create the criminal justice disparity. Uh, and it, what was more surprising, this is fully what I expected to see across the simulations, what was more surprising was the efficiency effect which indicated that if police persist in that process, it will actually be inefficient because they'll be fishing a pond dry. They'll essentially be continuing to be enforcing in a community whose at-large offending population is, is decreasing. But maybe more interesting is what if that minority group, if we make this very cynical assumption that that minority group really is offending at a higher rate. They're offending at a rate four times that of the majority group. And the police pay four times as much attention. They deploy four times as many officers to the, that community's neighborhood. What we find there is that there will also be this exaggeration of the criminal justice outcomes under those circumstances if police are using race as a basis of suspicion on top of all of the other legitimate bases of suspicion that they would be using. And again, the effect, the overall effect in terms of capturing more criminals is much more modest than I thought it would be across many different scenarios. So the argument that this is efficient and justified on that basis is, is very tenuous and on top of that it can create the very uh, disparities that generate the stereotypes that then again drive the, the disparities. The, in part, I wanted to bring that up because I had the um, very fortunate experience of after publishing those results, uh, one of the findings that I had in there was that, um, was that if we added to the mathematical model the notion that there could be deterrence, because that's another argument in favor of racial profiling, uh, what would happen then? Would you see a more effective, more efficient effect of racial profiling? So I allowed the model to say, well, people who detect that their probability of being stopped is higher are going to offend less. But what I had to do in order to do that was to acknowledge that, well, then people who detect that their probability of being stopped is lower should offend more. If deterrence works the way that people, the way that criminological canon holds that it works, that it's people responding to the cost of offending, people responding to the probability of being caught times the, times the punishment, um, then it can, should go in both directions. Uh, it's not gonna be the case that we're always increasing the cost of crime. There will be times where the cost of crime declines and you should see an increase in offending. And if the police are allocating their resources to one group and they have finite resources, that means that they're gonna have to be pulling resources from others and those marginal offenders in that group will likely detect a, change, a decrease in the cost of offending. They're less likely to get caught. You could see an increase. Well, I got, a, uh, I got contacted by a new young colleague, Amy Hackney, uh, from the University of South Georgia and uh, Georgia Southern University, and she said, I have an idea for testing that. Um, there's this paradigm for detecting cheating among students that's been very well validated. Uh, and we could give them, and we could give them the impression that students are being profiled based on their race while they're doing it. So we set up this elaborate situation where um, black and white students were doing this, basically solving anagrams, uh, but told it was a cognitive skills test. And then we, uh, we were able to detect, they scored their own test, and we were able to detect when they cheated and added correct responses that they hadn't actually made. And what we find is that when black students are doing the task, uh, there's no significant variation 
in the uh, degree to which they cheat on this task as a function of whether they think black students are being singled out, because we had the experimenter say, I want you and you to come up front where I can keep an eye on you, and she always picked two black confederates or two white confederates, or didn't do that at all. Um, and so, uh, so the black students are, are not sensitive to this. There's, the, there's a trend indicating they're a little more likely to cheat when they don't think that people are being watched, which kind of makes sense. Uh, white students, however, when they think that the black students are being profiled, they cheat a lot more, um, and, uh, and, that, and then they're insensitive to, to the other. And one of the interesting things here, I mean, this was consistent with what we expected, but we thought we might see the black students cheating more when they thought white students were being profiled. But our best guess is that they don't really have a schema for that. Black students seeing two white students called to the front of the room don't start thinking, oh, they're looking at the white students. Uh, whereas there's clearly a schema already for profiling of blacks. So I want to I want to just briefly touch on the collateral consequences of all of this, uh, because as I mentioned, the, obviously the lethal force cases and some of the dire non-lethal force cases have clear consequences for people's lives. But even just stop and frisk has has pretty dramatic consequences for people's lives. Um, the disparities that we see in New York, for example, and that replicate in cities across the country uh, in the rates at which whites and minorities are stopped and searched by the police uh, mean that there are going to be disparities in the just absolute number of times people have contact with the police, which again may or may not be a very benign event. Uh, the rates at which they're cited for being in violation of the law, the rates at which they're arrested for being in violation of the law, and again, there are a lot of reasons why people can be arrested, including outstanding warrants for unpaid parking tickets. Um, there is, uh, uh, and then of course, that if they're stopped at a, and searched at a disparate rate, they're more likely to have force used against them and to be incarcerated. And all of these things are gonna have collateral effects in terms of their sense of stigma and alienation from this disproportionate attention they're getting from the police, the financial costs that they're bearing for legal representation and paying fines, uh, the disenfranchisement, they get literally, people lose their voting rights when they get convicted of a felony, and not only do they get disenfranchised, but the communities that they belong to get disenfranchised. Uh, they experience trauma, and it can increase mortality, uh, and they lose human capital through incarceration. They are families who have wage earners who are gone, uh, and, and again, of course, they're also accruing legal costs. Um, and there's even evidence that communicable diseases uh, gets spread through communities as a function of incarceration rates, uh, including HIV. So let me just take a few more minutes to talk about um, what can be done about this. Again, with humility, because we're not really sure exactly what can be done. But I will say that I, um, I have a fair degree of confidence that at the very least, reducing officer discretion, and I'm gonna talk a lot about that, um, is the low-hanging fruit here. And we're seeing already in New York that it's having dramatic effects that I'll illustrate a little more soon. So very quickly, I just wanna point out what doesn't work. Um, and unfortunately, these are the typical policy responses to racially biased policing. Telling police officers that they should not exhibit racial bias doesn't help, because they don't think they're doing it, and if they do think they're doing it, they're probably okay with it. Um, Training on implicit bias, there's no evidence that it works. There are a lot of people trying to do it. There's not only no evidence that it works, but there's some evidence that it doesn't work. There's affirmative evidence that it doesn't work. Um, and, uh, and of course, data collection is useful, but it's, an end, it's a means to an end. It's not, although I will say that sometimes data collection can affect people's behaviors. So there, it's probably kind of a win-win with data collection, but it is not the solution. Um, it's, a, it's an interim step toward the solution. And we're working on that. Um, and there are other things that can be done that I don't have time to go into. I want to focus on two in particular, and actually really one in particular, as I mentioned, reducing discretion. I will say that meaningful community-oriented policing, and I think driven in particular by the psychological science on intergroup contact and the nuances of intergroup contact, would promote better police community relations and reduce bias decision-making among police. I'm not gonna go into that right now. I'm gonna focus on reducing discretion and I, it's so important to me that I animated it. And so um, in particular, the notion here is that as we 
give, as we reduce discretion in officers, so we essentially say you, you can't just be stopping anybody you feel like stopping, um, then they're going to be making fewer stops and they're going to be making their decisions based on a, the, the, the contribution to their decisions of the meaningful information is going to take up a greater proportion than before. Um, there's some nice empirical evidence uh, from back, criminal background checks and drug testing that uh, sociologists and economists have looked at, finding that employers who actually do criminal background checks are more likely to hire African Americans than employers that don't do criminal background checks. And similarly, employers who do drug testing are more likely to hire African Americans. Again, my social psychologist interpretation of this is that in the absence of this information, they rely on their stereotypes, but when provided with the actual information, they make less discriminatory judgments. Um, so that, again, the idea is make fewer decisions and you'll be more discerning. Uh, and if you're more discerning, you're gonna have a greater information to bias ratio. You're gonna, more of your decision is gonna be based on real information and less of it on bias, which should yield less discriminatory outcomes. I wanna give you a couple of really compelling case studies. One, and this is why I asked you to remember Raymond Kelly's name. Uh, this comes from uh, US Customs, and in 1998, Ray Kelly took over as the director of US Customs, and there's a really excellent uh, article by Malcolm Gladwell about this, where he interviews Kelly and others and documents this, but there's also a nice empirical study of it by some legal scholars. Essentially, Kelly notices that his customs agents are using a lot of criteria to determine who they should search. And customs is a nice case because it's like a perfect experiment. It's a funnel system. Everybody's going through the same system and the customs agents are making a discrete decision about who to get searched. Some of it is ran they have random selection of, of people to get searched, but they also do it based on profiling and based on who they think is suspicious. And so you can look there to see whether changes in policy will have a change and it's, a, it's fairly clean data in that regard. What Kelly did was he thought that most of these were bogus and he reduced the criteria that they should be using from 43 down to six, which were more behaviorally oriented, empirically based criteria that have act had actually been shown to be related to smuggling. And what, they, what we find is that in the, comparing the pre-policy change to the post-policy change period, you see that that reduction in the criteria for searches, not surprisingly, reduces the number of searches by 75%. But the hit rate, the findings of contraband, stayed the same, the, sorry, the hit rate quadrupled. The hits stayed the same. And so what we actually see is that um, they, got, they found just as many smugglers using a quarter as many search, searches, and so their quit, hit rate quadrupled. But in terms of racial disparities, the group that was getting too much attention in the previous period was Latinos, who were getting searched at a high rate but their hit rate was considerably lower here. You see they're at 1.4% compared to roughly 6% for blacks and whites. And after the policy change, their search rate, everybody's search rate comes down, their search rate becomes more comparable. This is not actually a search rate, it's a search number, but it maps on. And their hit rate gets much more comparable to the other two groups, and everybody's hit rate, as we knew from before, goes up considerably. So you get like a win-win-win situation here where fewer people are being interfered with, uh, the overall hit rate is higher and, and uh, the discriminatory outcome is lower. Similarly, coming back to New York, I'll wrap up soon, um, we see that you can have this dramatic variability in law enforcement decisions about who to stop and search over time. Um, and as I mentioned before, you start to see some compression as the discretion becomes lower, I'm calling it discretion. As the stop rate gets lower, you see some compression in the disparities uh, but we can, we can look more directly at that, and we can see that uh, over the period of the dramatic decline in stops uh, by the New York Police Department, uh, we see that, again, the hit rate in terms of contraband fines uh, increases considerably, and the disparity, at least in terms of hit rates, goes away or reverses, such that in 2011, you had, um, uh, well, at, at least in terms of Latinos, this, this one, it's pretty, pretty flat. The other ones I'm gonna show you, it's, there's a reversal. But more importantly, uh, the, the hit rate disparity converges some for blacks and whites. And if you think about it in terms of ratio, it's quite a bit closer, whereas before we're talking about 2.5 versus 1.6. Now we're talking about five versus 
proportionally, that's a much smaller disparity. For um, weapons fines, you see that black and white hit rates converge at this point, uh, indicating, again, the higher hit rates suggests that the, gr the group with the higher hit rates is, is being favored by the police and subjected to a higher threshold of suspicion in order to get stopped. So a conversion of hit rates here seems to suggest that there's less bias influencing these judgments. And again, remember, this is all in the environment of the, the search rate coming down so dramatically so that even if these hit rates weren't converging, the harm to the innocent members of the targeted communities has been reduced dramatically. But now the differential harm has been reduced as well. And you see that similarly with um, arrest rate, where actually at this point it flips. I'm not sure actually what to make of that because you don't want to see dis discrepancies as, uh, in, in these hit rates in general. And it's also plausible and possible that um, whites are less likely to get arrested because they are getting the benefit of the doubt from the officers or getting some slack. So these data are, there's a lot packed into these data, but the general trends are showing increasing hit rates, uh, overall decreasing disparities in hit rates, and this is all in the context of fewer stops and a flat line on crime in New York City. So just to finish up, my general recommendation is to the extent possible, it's not very psychologically sophisticated, but reducing officer discretion, which believe me is not, not a very welcome recommendation in many law enforcement circles, but is increasingly something that's being considered uh, is my main point. And I'll give the last word to the um, oxymoronic Ray Kelly, uh, who said that racial profiling is the wrong thing to do and it's also ineffective. <laughs> Say thank you. We have time. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, please. Um, I, I have, uh, I've shown it to some police officers. I've shown it to prosecutor groups, um, and uh, and I've shown it to judges. Um, and, uh, and I've tried the best I can, since a lot of these data are in my book, I've tried to get my book into the hands of police chiefs whenever possible. Um, what? To, you're okay? We'll do, we'll do. Um, and so uh, what I found is, um, you know, from, from, what I found is that prosecutors are surprisingly resistant to this idea. Uh, and I think it's in part because in a way, whereas police officers are doing these stops in a, you know, it's a fairly routine thing that they're doing and it's, um, it's not a particularly dramatic event for them unless it turns into a use of force situation. When prosecutors get a case, there's a lot of work and thought that goes into each individual case and they do not like to be told that anything is gonna undermine their ability to prosecute this individual. And so they don't want to hear about this stuff, uh, even more so than police. I find police, I guess what I'm saying is I find police to be more receptive to this than prosecutors are. Um, that said, again, we don't have any evidence that talking to police about this stuff changes their behavior, which is one of the reasons why I'm focusing on discretion because that's more of a policy level thing. That's, you know, if, if the departments can change the incentives, which is what New York has done, uh, then, and I'm, I'm Believe me, I'm not arguing that New York is fixed <laughs> by any means. They still have big problems, but you can see there's been progress. And I also don't know how long that will be sustained. But, um, but yeah, I think to the extent that you can uh, implement a policy change that changes the incentives so that there are fewer discretionary activities, then you're gonna just have less opportunity for biased outcomes. It, yeah, you are next. Yeah, um, really enjoyed uh, your talk. I, I remember a paper that Josh Carell wrote a few years ago where he kind of did a review of, you know, how many studies have been done using the shooter tasks. And I think that I'm right in remembering that he actually finds that police officers are less biased in the shooter tasks than community members are, with the exception of members of what he calls street crimes units. Uh, and I wonder if you could comment about that and whether that might reflect sort of a self-fulfilling schematic prophecy 
or if there may be some self-selection of, of officers going into those units. Right. Wow, that's a great question. I remember that paper too. And I won't try to remember what I thought of it at the time. I'll just get my current thoughts on it, um, which uh, is that I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's common for people to self-select into a street crime unit. I think that's mostly going to be a supervisor decision. So I think it's probably not a selection effect. But there's a lot of reason to believe that it's an experience effect. And I was talking with someone earlier today about this, that um, officers now, I, I do think there's a selection effect in terms of who goes to the academy. I think officer, people who go to the police academy are more conservative than the general population. Um, and there's probably some reason to believe that they're more racially biased. They're not categorically different. They're just on that continuum. They're a little farther out on both those continua. Um, but then what happens is they get some enculturation in the academy, and then they get a heavy dose of enculturation in their field training. So the period when they're on probation just post-academy and they're in the field and they're paired up with a field training officer uh, is, a, is a very influential time in their careers. And I've, I've been told this repeatedly by seasoned police officers. And they will tell you about little things like, you know, my first rotation was a graveyard shift. And then I got rotated off that into the daytime shift and I didn't even recognize the neighborhood that I was in. And if they're with an FTO who is telling them essentially that those guys are no good, you know, the, everybody's up to no good, they're going to be enculturated in a different way. And, and that, that's going to have a lasting impact on them. That's going to be very hard, hard to reverse. So I think street, street crimes units are like that. In fact, the whole stop and frisk grew out of the street crimes unit. Um, and so I think that happens. And, and one thing I'll just add is a little bit off the topic is that the, in my view, the occupational hazard of policing is not a physical threat, it's a psychological threat. That the job of policing is so fraught with making negative judgments of other people and looking for bad behavior, that, officer, that, that becomes a part of their daily psychology and they will tell you they, they bring it home, it affects their relationships, it affects their self-esteem, um, and, and uh, it's, it's a serious problem for them that rises far above the, the physical threats they, they encounter on the job. Yes. So I wanted to ask you a question about training. So um, the police department held a public discussion of their fair and impartial training. And I just so decided to do a paper on fair and impartial training. And um, I, I'm 52 and decided to go back and get a PhD. I know I'm crazy. 52. Um, but I was unhappy with the curriculum because it used a number of stereotypes with the caveat that they're not going to talk about race and they're not going to talk about these things to make police officers uncomfortable. And I saw your slide, which can you give me that? That's like gold. Um, that this uh, this training, this uh, implicit bias training, doesn't work. So I want to know what I, what I think is it's who you hire, but so what does work? So what do you do? Right. When you have a culture of PD, you know, 10 years, and they have those types of quirky things that you talked about when yeah. they come in, yeah. how, how can they be trained? Can, they, can it be undone? If that, because if, that's right. coming from the DOJ. The DOJ mm -hmm. sponsors this training by Lori Friedel that uh, we're going to, we're not going to talk about race, right. we're going to talk about you know, but then they yeah. use stereotypes to teach right. it, so I don't get it. Well, um, and empirically, it's just the case that we have no reason to believe that that training changes police officer behavior. At, at best, they have evaluation scores for afterwards saying the officers like the training. Uh, and they may even say that their attitudes have improved, but uh, there's, there's no performance data that indicates that they're, that they're exhibiting any less bias on the job. And, and the reason for that, and this is why, even though I don't think implicit bias is the root of all evil, but is important, uh, I think the reason is partly that the, it's the very normalcy of implicit cognition and implicit bias. The notion that you could train away people's implicit associations doesn't make any sense. And if you could do it, and believe me, there are people trying. There are labs all over the world trying to reduce implicit bias. But what they typically find is you can get it, you can decrease it statistically significantly for an hour, uh, and 24 hours later, it comes roaring back because there's been a lifetime of learning. 
Uh, it's, it's, it's really basic learning theory. Um, and so, you know, my view is, again, the interim, the interim solution is to, uh, yeah, yes, I do think you can change police culture, uh, and I think departments should be striving for that. And I think that there should be sanctions for officers who exhibit bias, but also exhibit the, the attitude that they can do what they want, you know, that they can exercise this much discretion. So you can change that culture, but I think in terms of changing the attitudes, that's a generational prospect. And I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat optimistic about that. I mean, if you look at the data, racial attitudes have improved in the United States. Right now, we're having a moment because we've got, we're confronted with video evidence of leth unnecessary lethal force against people of color. So we're confronting it right now, but the problem is not worse now than it was before. In fact, the data, the data indicates that's slightly better. It's, it's improved slightly, but, but it's been bad for a long time and we're now just c confronted with incontrovertible evidence. And that's great, and, and some things are starting to happen. I'm not super optimistic about the current Department of Justice on this front, but at the local level, <laughs> You might wonder why. At the local level, um, there are still things happening. And you do see police chiefs right now saying, no, Jeff Sessions, we want our consent decree. We like our, we worked it out. And Oakland has been very happy to go along with the federal monitor. New York, I'm working with the federal monitor in New York, and I think that, you know, I, I think the city is going, going with it in a pretty sincere, meaningful way. Um, so, uh, Again, though, I, I think you know, what we can do right now is prevent the, or reduce the opportunities for the bias to be exhibited, and that means stop and frisk has got to go. And, and again, we're seeing in New York that they've basically gotten rid of it and they're not facing a crime wave. And I'm, I'm sure you know, the crime will blip up one of these years and people will point to it and say, look, see what happened, um, just like they're pointing to Chicago right now. Um, by the way, St. Louis has the highest murder rate in the country per capita, not Chicago. But Chicago has the most murders in the country because it's a bigger city. Um, so there's, uh, isn't it nice to have someone to give you beautiful statistics like that? It's really uplifting. Um, so you're safe. You're, what, 100 and some miles from St. Louis. So, good. so um, yeah, so, so I think reducing discretion is what we can do right now. And then there'll be a generational prospect. But I'll say one other nice piece of anecdotal evidence, which was I was at one of these conferences with police chiefs, and one police chief just unprompted uh, got up and said, to the day, my police department became professionalized when women joined the force. And uh, you know, he, he, and this is an old grizzled police chief, and he felt it deep in his core. Um, and so there are, there are environmental and cultural changes that can matter, and whatever it is that women are doing and contributing, we need to bottle it and figure out how to get men to do it too. Uh, and there are some very, very progressive chiefs um, in the country. Uh, somebody was, oh, Tucson. Check out Chris Magnus in Tucson. Very, very thoughtful, progressive guy. Yes. Yes? Um, long ago, I read But a similar group, not in police, but I remember the long section talking about making the decision about who get, goes to the hospital and who doesn't, who's having a heart attack. And it's a long, and of course, the resistance from physicians, all of whom had their experience and so forth, and just their decisions were off the chart bad, wrong. And if I remember correctly, I don't know what it came up with. I think it was exactly the same thing. When they would do, and they have, they used like four factors, they dramatically reduced the good incomes about who should go, decreased the bad incomes about uh, who should get missing on it. But it was all about that discretion. And it sounds like that is a social psychology issue for another group of people who believe that they are the experts right. based on their, their experience. Right. And in particular, their decentralized experience at private practicing positions. Does that make sense to see this as a, a, parallel, a parallel world 
I see that as reinforcing this. Now, I know a lot, of, I've spent a lot of time reading about community policing, and a lot of that is about moving discretion down to be officers. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure that that is, makes them feel better. Yeah. And in some sense, may, there may be some, but I'm seeing parallels here. Yeah. And I'll be much more interested in hearing, not today, about your intergroup, it's the science of intergroup contact. Right. Yeah, I, I think I understand the gist of yeah. where that's going. And it crosses over all kinds of things. Right. It might be the thing that might effectively change the length of period in which biases operate. Yeah. Or, or some other, that kind of stuff, yeah. because you're actually no people. Right. You're not working off your limit. Actually, what you're doing is you're using or filling in the stem much more. Yeah. So they're not having to make to disambiguate with too narrow right. stereotypes. Right. Does that make sense? It does, uh, on, a, on a number of levels. And one of them is just that one of the central lessons of social psychology is that people don't really know what they know. And they overestimate their objectivity and their ability, and their, they enhance their own ca capacity relative to others in, you know, in a biased sort of way. So you know, on the one hand, we're really quite remarkable information processing machines. You know, we, you know, we, we can handle a lot of information automatically, spontaneously, et cetera. Um, but on the other hand, we're deeply fallible <laughs> information processing machines. And, and we tend not to really recognize it because it would be devastating to be constantly questioning our own judgment. And there are people like that and they're messed up. And so there's, um, there's that aspect to it. And then there's the aspect of, yeah, um, formalizing the decision-making process and being prescriptive about it. So it's not just a matter of saying, you can't do that, but here's how you should do it instead. And that's what Ray Kelly did with the customs agency. He said, use these six variables, don't use those other ones. Now again, people are gonna resist that because they, they, they wanna enjoy their work, they, you know, and part of the enjoyment is the fluidity of it and the making the judgment and using their brain and, and all that, and they don't wanna just be a computer. Um, so they, they have to find ways to maintain the, maintain the um, gratifying nature of the work without you know, turning people into robots or outsource it to robots, which is another thing that is happening in, in a firm. Was there any data from what Kelly said in customs officials about the reaction to the customs officers? They just don't sit, you said, right. they didn't just say don't do this. Yeah. They gave them a different checklist. Yeah. And did they- I don't know, know yeah. That's a great question. Is there any I don't know. I don't know, but that, that's an answerable question. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll stick around. Thank you.